Welcome to Rocket to Anywhere, the show whose hosts forget if Taste the Rainbow is from Starburst or from Skittles. I'm Corvan. And I'm James. Today on the show, we're joined by my friend James to talk about the third season of Netflix's adaptation of the classic book series, A Series of Unfortunate Events by Lemony Snicket. So, how are you doing today, James? Just peachy. Okay, great. So, as always, when we have a guest, we're going to go over the uh, guest introduction three questions segment, which are, who are you, what do you do, and what is your third favorite book and movie? Because in reality, most people have problems trying to figure out what their first number one favorite thing is, but they're like, I have this one on the side that I like better, but I'm not going to say it's the first one. So, let's get started with, who are you? Who would you say you are? Well, I'm James. That's who I'd say I am. I'm a fairly significant individual with a zero sphere of influence. Great. Now, what would you? What do you say you do? I'm a contractor, a media contractor right now. So I like to I edit video, I archive it. But I mean, gosh, that's all I do. Do you have any hobbies on the side? You like doing things? Oh yeah, I like to read a little bit. I also like to play video games a lot. I like to sleep even more. Do you have any video games you're playing right now? That you're I'm enjoying? playing through Just Cause Four right now. Okay, it's okay. It's mm-hmm. fine. Anything you're looking forward to coming out soon? Gosh, I haven't even looked forward to this this year. I mean, the immediate future, I think, is Ace Combat 7. Mm-hmm. That's in February. I don't know when this is going up, but... Probably within a week. Okay. So, yeah, Ace Combat 7 is coming out mid-February or something like that. But beyond that, I I don't know. Isn't E3 in a couple of weeks or something? No, E3 is in June. In June, okay. There's I a game. There's the... Uh, I want to say it's a New York Games Con, but that New York Comic Con's back in like November or October. Mm-hmm. There is there's a German. It's a German conference that's coming up. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was when CES happens, I get all the conferences confused around and. Well, that's why E3 broke away from CES. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know what? That's probably. I'm still thinking of the old days when it was like that. <laughs> You're not even old enough to think. What? I used to report on CES back on my old show, and I would be doing daily coverage of it. What, when you were five? Like when I was 11 or 10. <laughs> it was terrible. Okay. You, can't, you can't watch any of this anymore. Oh, They're all private. Sad. Unless you have downloaded you can't be sh- You can't be shared to share your past. Mm-hmm. You can't be afraid to share your past. Okay. The old, oldest thing I have is from like 2014, I think. Still public. Hmm. Yeah, it's the oldest thing I can tolerate. I've got a video up on my own YouTube channel that's like, it's from my junior year of high school and it's a piece of garbage. <laughs> but you know what? It's got 30 views and holding strong. So great. thank you. Bet you're living strong off that AdSense money. I didn't even advertise <laughs> on it. You can't anymore. They changed rules. Yeah. So that 4,000 hours of watch time and all that. Okay, so we have no follow-up this week because, uh, well, the only follow-up there is is about Boz, which we talked about last week, but I'm sure James doesn't care about Boz. Nope. Or even knows what Boz is. Nope. Okay, it's I saw. I think I saw you post it. It was that children's show Yeah. that was like Australian or something? No, it was – okay, so the executive producers of Barney went off and made this Christian ver- version oh, of Barney no. with a green bear. Okay. And anyway, it was it was it had very catchy music because basically we spent an hour talking about the music of the show. It was really good. So you grew up with it. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. The church library, they had like every collection of every DVD. Of course, so they that's do. all we would watch. That's all they ever have. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's go into our th- thoughts of the week slash sour thoughts. So, uh, what do you have today? <laughs> <laughs> I've been knocking around this thought. Ever since you asked me to be on this, but it's extremely morbid. <laughs> it's just the fact that we're all tiny, tiny individuals in a cosmos that's so big and vast. And not to mention, we're also trapped within this one moment of time that nobody else will remember or care about. Mm-hmm. It's just infinite time behind us, infinite time before us, infinite space all around us. And we're just really, really tiny. And it's strange to think about and other people might think that's kind of depressing but i don't know it reminds me of that arthur episode where buster's standing on the playground and there's like a mosquito on him or something Mm -hmm. and then they zoom out and you see him then you see the schoolyard then you see the school then you see the town then you see the state zooms out of the world all the way to the 
entire universe is showing. That's deep. Very. And then it just cuts to him going, perspective. <laughs> okay. My thought of the week is uh, I, I've run out of all the deep stuff after all these episodes of the show. So all I got is simple stuff like tomatoes being classified as fruit makes ketchup a type of jelly. Wow. I didn't know that's what it took for jelly to be classified as jelly. Yeah, was that it needed to come from a fruit? Well, the government says that tomatoes are a vegetable because that's how they're classified for taxation. But the seeds are on the inside. Yep. Which means everyone else calls it a fruit, which means ketchup is a jelly. It's interesting. That's, that doesn't make any sense. I don't know. I mean, we have jelly packets, so and we also have ketchup packets, so it makes sense. Sure, if you want to look at it like that. But <laughs> never mind the fact that jelly is a completely different viscosity mm-hmm. and prepared entirely differently. Eh. It's, it's like Sophia's argument a couple of weeks ago about how bananas are berries. <laughs> she tried. She gave it like a 15-minute proof on why bananas are berries based on the seed structure or something and how they grow. I just flew over my head. I'm just like, sure, I'll put the link in the show notes. Sure. People can do their own research. Okay. Okay. So our word this week, as always, is a word I can't pronounce, and it's especially hard this week because it's French. So I'm going to spell it out. Wait, do you know French. I know bit. a little bit, but I didn't take it as a language, no. Okay. Okay, so I'll spell it out, then I'll try to say it, and maybe you can correct me. So it's J-U-S-Q-U-A-U-B-O-U. T I S T E. Juice Hus Quabunstein? I'm going to have to see the word because spelling it out for me, I can't visualize it like that. So yeah. Spell it again J U S Q U Q U apostrophe A U B O U B or V B O U T I S T E. What in the world? To the very end. Yeah, to the very end of this language. Yep. So that's why I picked this word, because it means a person who advocates on carrying a conflict until the bitter end or until a conclusive victory, one has been gained or all of one's aims achieved. Basically, put it in short, someone is going to keep carrying out a conflict until the end. I saw this thing on online uh, series of posts mm-hmm. of people talking about just different languages. Everybody likes to beat up on the English language. They compare it to like a guy and a, a homeless man in a trench coat who goes into back alleys and beats up other languages and <laughs> yeah. mugs them for apostrophes. Take and, that Latin. Yeah. But then people started dissecting French and they started looking at words like this and they say, why? Why do they do this? For the art of it. Mm-hmm. The word must be beautiful. And take minutes to pronounce. Yeah. Okay. Well, I picked that word because it's basically kind of, eh, it relates to serious unfortunate events in some way. Kind of. I'm sure it's a thing Klaus would say at some time. Then we would pause and copy the captions into Google and try to figure out what it means. Yeah. Okay. So on to jokes. As I have been saying for the past 20 episodes, we keep cutting this segment down from what used to be 20 minutes. Now it's down to two minutes or less, I hope, because according to our analytics, people don't like this segment. Oh, that's sad. But I like it. So I, I, got, I got a really good set of jokes, actually. Okay. So go ahead with yours first, then. So I I heard these two jokes. I heard this first one when I was kind of younger, and I heard the second one when I was older. Mm-hmm. These three guys are walking along, and they see this pile of mud on the ground, and they see a pile of bricks uh, next to it. And they're like, hey, you know, this is a huge mud puddle. Why don't we throw bricks up in the air and see how f- far the brick will go down into the mud? Mm-hmm. So the first guy picks up a brick and he throw- tosses that up in the air and it sinks down into the mud about maybe a foot. So the second guy's like, all right, I can do better than that. So he takes a brick and he throws it up in the air and it sinks down into the mud for about an- about another three feet. And okay. The third guy's like, that's nothing. Watch this. And he takes the brick and he throws it up in the air and it doesn't come back. <laughs> no, that's good. So the the other thing, the other joke I have, uh, there's this woman who uh, wants to book passage on a plane. 
Okay. And this, for whatever reason, this flight uh, is no smoking and no parrot flight. But of course, she wants to bring her parrot along with her. <laughs> so she smuggles her parrot in uh, under her jacket. And manages to get through security, surprisingly, in a day and age where that would probably not happen. Just go with it. But she manages to get on the plane, and they actually take off, and they're at cruising altitude, and everything's going perfectly fine. You know, the bird's happy. It's been quiet. And she's kind of, like, been feeding it a little snack every now and again. So everything's great. And then while they're at cruising altitude, the captain comes back out of the cabin, out of the cockpit, and starts, you know, greeting all the all the passengers and be like, hey, you know, welcome to the flight. Thanks for joining us. And he gets to the woman and he, you know, goes through his spiel and the woman's like, oh, thank you very much. And then all of a sudden you hear, Rawr! and the captain's like, wait a second, what is that? And so she's like, uh, nothing. Oh, I forgot, I forgot to mention, uh, the captain came back, the captain's walking back and he's actually got a cigar in his mouth mm-hmm. and he's been smoking it this whole time. Oh. But anyway, you can, you can rework that in post, right? Sure. <laughs> but. And if I didn't, then you know why I didn't. You heard it. Thanks. You heard it the way it is. <laughs> so the captain starts yelling at the lady, like, lady, you can't have parrots on this flight. And the lady stands up and starts challenging him. And she's like, well, you can't be smoking on this flight. And they start yelling at each other until finally the captain actually grabs the parrot and opens the window next to them and tosses the parrot out. And the woman's like, <gasps> I can't believe you did that. And she grabs the cigar and tosses it out too. And then they close the window. The captain goes back to the cockpit and he's just fuming. He's like, can't believe woman throw up my cigar, bringing a parrot on here. And he hears a tapping at the window next to him. And he looks over and he sees the parrot. And you know what it's got in its beak? The cigar. No, the brick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's good. I thought you were going to go the way of like, the parrot with the cigar and then like that sign that goes around about the dog on a skateboard no. with a cigarette. Okay. Anyway, spend too much time on Reddit. Things get predictable. <laughs> Speaking of Reddit, there were some real slim pickings this week on Reddit for jokes because I have run out of creativity of humor. So That seems to be a running theme. I am mm-hmm. run out of things. Please send me your thoughts. Yes. We ask people to send us their jokes, but the ones they send are something we've already said before. And I hope nobody said that one before, yeah. the one I said. They're like, no, I've never heard anyone say that before. Okay. Never seen it anywhere, actually, either. We used I, to get our jokes from this joke book. I, I will be perfectly honest. I shamelessly stole that set of jokes from Bernie Burns of Rooster mm-hmm. Teeth. I've, I he, see it all He the said time. it on his podcast a while ago, and I thought it was the funniest thing I've ever heard. So. <laughs> okay. You know, I'll ask you about podcasts later at the end. Okay. I want to talk to you about that. Okay, so I just got two real simple jokes that are the did you hear section. So so did you hear about the the days the cows ran away? No. It was utter madness. I've been saving that one. So are these like just uh, jokes? That's that's the trend. The jokes I tell are mostly just people groan at me when I tell my jokes now. Fantastic. It's probably the thing that people call me a grandma. (laughs) Did you hear about... um, those corduroy pillows? No, I didn't. They've been uh, leaving headlines everywhere. I just, I mean, I should have seen it coming. Mm-hmm. You, you think you see it coming and you just walk right into it. That's usually how they are, these jokes. Okay, so uh, we, we kind of sped through that opening uh, a little bit. And so now we're going to get on to our topic time, which, as I said at the top of the show, is going to be our discussion on Netflix's adaptation of A Series of Unfortunate Events Season 3 and maybe some talking about the season as a whole now that the entire show is wrapped up. Are we doing spoilers before yes. we get into this? There's spoilers, definitely. Okay. We can spoil anything we want. Because I definitely – I have thoughts, but they're very spoilery, and I just want to make sure that – that people have seen the series or at least care to before yeah. we start ruining it. And um, if you haven't read the books. Go read the books. Yeah. Now, I won't tell you stop the show and go read the books because that will be a couple, maybe a month, depending on how fast you read or how slow you read. Or just go watch the Netflix series. Yeah. That will be shorter. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hey, how many times have you watched the series? Just the once through. Okay. Because when season two came out, I rewatched season one. But when season three came out, I just went straight into it. Well, when I watch it the first time through, I watch it alone, mm-hmm. usually ahead of my brothers. 
Mm-hmm. I have two brothers, by the way, mm-hmm. and they're both into the show. So I'll watch it first because they're busy doing something else. And then I'll usually catch watching it with them while they're watching it or trying to watch it alone. Sitting on your, the edge of your seat just like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Just waiting I like, for it. I, I come in on the good parts. I'm like, yeah, yeah this is good right here. Lean like, over Shut the up. shoulder. <laughs> so Sophia does. She'll pause it until I get, walk away. And then I'll just stand behind the door like, right there. Okay. Uh, so before we get into the whole discussion, I wanted to ask you, when did you get into a series of unfortunate events? When did, did you like first start the books? When the books first came out. I okay. was, I don't, I didn't start with Bad Beginning. I mm-hmm. seem to recall Miserable Mill being my first one. Okay. And I think that was about my last, my fourth grade year. So the last year at elementary. Okay. I remember um, I had seen the books when I was in first grade on the shelf, and I checked out The Bad Beginning. And then for some reason, I just never read it, and I returned it. And then my brain was like, oh, you already read that series. And even though I didn't, so I passed it on the shelf for years until I remember seeing them out on a display case. And I said, oh, I don't – you know what? I never actually read those. So I was going to start with The Bad Beginning, um, and I read The Bad Beginning – and then I couldn't get the rest of the books uh, because they were all on hold because it was right when season one was about to start mm. coming out because everyone started requesting the books. Same yeah. thing that happened with – I don't remember what other book series that was. That's besides the point. So I skipped to I think the fifth book and then I read from the fifth book to the 13th book. Then I watched season one and then I read the second, third, and fourth books okay. after – so I read it a little bit out of order, but I kind of knew what was going to happen. I definitely recall picking up hostile, the Hostile Hospital. That cover stuck out, stood out to me mm-hmm. and its color. It was bright orange. I remember that in middle school. I was reading it when it was in seventh grade. And then again when it came out, when they were doing – it was near the end of the series, Penultimate Peril. I was – I think it was still seventh grade or eighth grade. Because everybody, like everybody in the school, was talking about that one, which was really surprising. Hmm. What do you think of the new covers that they've done for the? I don't care for them. Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. I don't really like. Them. I like the classic illustrations by Brett Helquist. Yep. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Have you seen any of his other art? Nope. Okay. He has a good Instagram account. Posts all sorts of sketches and things. Oh, well, good to see he's still doing stuff. Yep. Okay. So. Uh... I guess we can get started going through each of the episodes. Uh, a note on the episode titles. Did you notice that they removed the word the? Yes. From all of them. Except a little for the aggravating. Other. I know. Slippery slope. Grim grotto. That, that feels wrong. But anyway. Okay. Let's get started with the slippery slope. Do you have any overall thoughts on that? I, th- I think it's about almost exactly how I pictured it in my, in my mind. Mm-hmm. The... the uh, peak or the plateau that they stayed on for the most part that was basically what I envisioned in my head uh-huh. uh huh I for the most part I liked the episode I wasn't a huge fan of the major change they made at the end because I just remember it being so vivid in my mind the last sequence when they're coming down the mountain when the ice breaks and they actually flow into the stream, yeah. stricken stream and it's this churning mess of water mm-hmm. You know, they lose Quig in this in the Netflix series. They lose Quigley by him getting hit by a tree, and he's just kind of hanging on a branch, like ah, yeah. goodbye. In the in the book, he gets thrown off the toboggan because you know it's a, a violent stream. So yeah, I don't know. I just I pictured I pictured that to be more cinematic and more dramatic. Instead, it ended up like the Polar Express kind of with the yeah, which <laughs> ending up okay. on the ice. Since when is the Quig Quig an icebreaker? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, what, did you th- what did you think? I th- it was exactly what I thought was in the book, except, like you said, except for that ending there. And then there were some rumors going about that when Quigley and Violet were on that ledge that they were going to do something with it other than what happened in the book. But no, they kept it to the book. Which is, I yeah, think, I was surprised by that. I, w- I was happy that they kept it. Kept the drama the way out. way it was. Yeah. yeah. The uh, SMA's fire dress, I always thought it would be different. Envisioned it different. Yeah. But, I mean, I didn't really understand fashion and kind of what uh, Snicket was describing. I'm going to mm-hmm. – I mean, he has an actual – it's Handler. 
Yeah. Is his real name, but Daniel I'm just going to keep referring to him as Snicket. Yeah. But um, the way the way he would describe certain clothing, I would always kind of imagine it differently. Mm-hmm. My one problem um, that I have with last season and this season is when his hench people start leaving. Yes, off. yes. Let's talk about that. Yes. I can't believe they didn't have the guts to kill off the henchmen. Yeah. Come on. You killed Olaf. You killed Kit. Kill more people. Yeah. Like, I don't understand why they didn't leave the hench person of intermediate gender in the hospital to burn. Yeah. Or let the – it's the large bald man who gets eaten by the lions, right? Yeah. Yeah. But then the white-faced women, they just walk off on their yeah. own accord. And, and I, I don't – I mean, what would – why – what purpose did they serve? Just – Other than comedic fill. I mean, I, I liked their comedic side. I thought yeah. they were, I thought they were pretty well done there. I think in the books they're mostly just foils for Olaf, who kind of hogs the attention. Mm-hmm. So I like the personality that they brought to the characters. I like what they did with them. Yeah. I think it was probably the best decision you could have done. I wrote down here like what service did they have other than the source of witty one-liners and being a bench warmer because they could have replace them with uh, people from the carnival instead of stuffing them in the trunk, and then we could have learned more about them. Yeah, but we're going to kill the people from the carnival now. Yeah, all in one go. And you, It was like, oh, they're dead now. Okay, yeah. I guess so. Well, are they dead? That's the question. They don't really – they were kind of clever with that. They don't really say we killed them. They, well, s- they say it sounded like a, a bunch of fr- circus freaks dying, but – I mean, they never straight up say, "Oh yes, we killed them." Well, it, it was the man with the man with beard and no hair on yeah. his head. Yeah, he. I mean, him and the woman with, with hair, hair on her no head beard. but no beard. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they would have never spared the life. Oh sure, I'm. They I'm sure just, they probably would have killed him. But yeah. again, we don't know, and that's kind of tying back into the the whole hench people not dying. There's mm-hmm. this certain vagueness that the book always leaves you with. Yeah. That there's never – you don't get all the answers mm-hmm. with the books. They don't fully confirm one way or another if people survive, if uh, certain items are actually where they're supposed to be, if you know other members of VFD are still alive or around. Yeah. I it, think that happens because – it's from the perspective of Lemony Snicket as a right. member. And I'm fine with that. I like the vagueness. I like the ambiguity. And you have to come up with, well, sure, maybe they are or maybe they're not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's fine by me. But I just felt like the Netflix series went out of its way to answer more questions than it really needed to. Mm-hmm. And that's why the Hinch people didn't die. They wanted – instead of having kind of a vague ending for them, they wanted them to have a more of a happy ending at the end. So – Even though – um I. Have you ever gone out and listened to any of the uh, Unfortunate Associates podcast episodes? Nope. Okay, so they have a podcast. Uh, this was my recommendation of the week, but I'll put it here. And they've gone out and they've done a bunch of interviews with the writers of the show, and they did an interview with Daniel Handler himself to yeah. talk about the show. And he said that when he wrote this, he said he was looking at it like a second approach, doing stuff he wished he would have done in the books. That makes so sense. A lot of uh, things that we complain about and other fans complain about could just be something he wanted to do from the beginning. But, sure. Yeah. And, and that's his prerogative. It's his creative work. You know, it's like Luke, George Lucas going back and retouching the original trilogy. People mm-hmm. get angry at him for it, but it's his right. It's his work. And if he felt like I wanted to do this, but I was limited by something or I didn't really know how to express it, then he can certainly go back and retouch it and let the public decide whether or not they like it or not. Yeah, they've been doing that to Arthur recently. They've been going back and recutting it. Interesting. And I, and especially a lot of people, hate it because they're <laughs> cutting out a lot of the best things ever. Anyway, because, you know, the show got weird sometimes yes. in the first few seasons, and now they're just cutting it out. And now it's just weird. Or no, it's just straight-faced? Yeah. Oh, that's just weird. like, oh, life lessons and morals without fun stuff. Great. Okay. Perspective. My uh, last thought on the slippery slope is um, at the end when the the eagles come to take the snow scouts, I always thought it was more than three eagles. I thought it would be like a huge flop. Whatever happened to the snow scouts? That's the last we ever see of them. Well, they, they went to go work in the 
Oh, that's right. That's right. Never mind. Duh. Yeah. But after Stupid. that, what happened to them there? Yes. That's the Well, we could assume that <clears> – I assume that they stayed on and helped pilot the ship. Yeah. But we'll, we'll get to that. Probably. But the thing is, after that, they have nowhere to go. Yep. Because all their homes got burned. Yep. So we'll get to that. More friends. Okay. Anything else you have to say on the slippery slope? I thought it was fine. Okay. It's just okay. Good season opener. Good se- it's a good season opener. Okay. I wish they would have ended the – I wish they would have actually had the cliffhanger of them tossing about on the stricken stream instead of opening up the – showing up on the sub. Mm-hmm. But – that's personal taste. Also, budget constraints, probably. Maybe. Even though they got more budget. I, yeah, I feel like they the budget wasn't necessarily a problem. It was just time. Yeah. They like they constantly kept saying, we got to get this stuff out because the kids mm-hmm. are growing up. Yeah. And you can see them getting visibly older. So we want to get this done. Yeah, like the opening before... of season two. Yeah. Wow, Sunny looks a lot bigger. Sure. Moving on. Yep. Let's accept it. Also, uh, speaking of that, a lot – in this slippery slope when she was talking to Fernald, uh, the hook-handed man. Was that actually her voice? Because I don't think it was. I think they got someone to do a dub when she spoke. Could be. Anyway, there was um, a picture going around of... Okay, Presley Smith has a double, basically, mm-hmm. who can do stunts, but is also a toddler. Okay. And they used her for a lot of the shots in the end, apparently. I don't know. Okay. That's weird. On to the Grim Grotto. Overall thoughts on that. Do you have anything here? I have a serious problem with this one. Why? I I think the majority of it's just okay, but they cut out Captain Wittershins. Mm-hmm. Why? Why did he have to leave? I know. That he was the most point. fun character. Like, reading the book, he's just all over the map. Mm-hmm. He's like, look out, look ahead, look above, look behind you, look out for each other. Look out! I... Mm-hmm. It's just constantly nonstop. I would I was looking forward to seeing that translated yeah. on the screen, and they All just they completely just cut his character on the wall. I I don't understand exactly why they did that. I don't know if that necessarily contributed more to the drama because now I have a harder time believing that Fiona can pilot this ship by herself. Yeah, I could understand it if it's Captain Wittershins and his daughter, stepdaughter. Yeah, that. He's taught how to do it. Fine, sure. But this is a little girl. I mean, we've seen that kids are more capable than adults. That's yeah. the running theme. I get that. That might that's probably why Widdershins wasn't in it. Maybe. To reinforce that theme of huh. kids are more But then again, you think back on it and if Fiona was so like um skeptical of the Baudelaire's, why did she let him into the submarine in the first place? Well, in the book, it's because Wittershins knows their family yeah. and because they identify themselves as members of VFD by using mm-hmm. the passphrase, which they didn't do. I was yeah. – s- mm. They just looked in it and it opens. Come on. Yeah. Use, the se- use the secret phrase that's so meaningful mm-hmm. and it's like, ooh, so spooky and mysterious. Sing a little song or something. Ugh. This is the one episode I took like barely any notes on. It's just empty and it's – isn't Captain Wittershins supposed to be on the sub with Fiona? Yeah. Uh, the design of the sub's neat. It's basically what I imagined, although it's more linear, and I'm okay with that. I don't like uh, the adult path that occurred in the last episode and this episode. So in the last episode, we saw Kit Snicket being chased by the uh, man with no man with a beard and no hair and a woman with hair but no beard. And then she jumps off into the stricken stream and loses the sugar bowl. She meets up with Mr. Poe. They go back into town. Also, why was he in there? Why was he there? Solely for the reason of she could be – this is what I'm saying. Like all of this was just for the setup for this episode Mm -hmm. where she sends quickly to to retrieve the Baudelaire's at the Grim Grotto. But then, of course, he can't because of the mycelium's growing on the staircase. Yeah. But like that's the – only thing like that's all it serves it doesn't do anything else there's no other point for her to be there at mr poe's office posing as his not secretary yeah it's just strange so i didn't really i didn't really like that i thought it was really linear really forced Hmm. just it served the plot and no other reason when they're in uh in the submarines underwater we see the question mark Yes. What is your opinion on what the question mark is? 
on what it is. Yeah, what do you think it is? That's the great unknown, man. I always thought it was a – the book describes it as the eyebrow. I never saw that. Uh, the, it's that last illustration from Hellquest at the end of the end mm-hmm. of the open sea and you just see the question mark there. That's what I thought of, just kind of this long tentacle in a shape of a question mark and then like the eye somewhere in the middle of that. My personal opinion is that it's the abominating beast from Well, all sure, if you, re- if you go ahead and read – the extended material, yeah, you can form that opinion. Sure. I think I mean, in the books it says it's a question mark shaped beast. Yes. Who can be called with the whistle, which we see in the end. Did you notice that? No. Oh. So there's, there's a statue that's the shape of the abominating beast, which is the shape of a question mark. Yes. And if you blow into it, it summons the abominating beast to you, wherever you are. Interesting. Yeah. Anyway, also all the wrong questions is. A weird book series. It's, yes, it is. It's not easy to recommend. It's like a 1940s film noir weird crime thing. Yeah. It's very weird. And if they – I mean I don't see – I was talking to Sophia about this. I don't see how they could adapt that into a series. No. I was curious to see if they would get renewed, if they're still going to get renewed for ad- – to adapt any of the other material snickets mm-hmm. done. Like the unauthorized biography, the Beatrice letters, or all the wrong questions, seeing if they could work that into some sort of just mini documentary. Because if – like there's only four books. And then if you take the two extra books that they did, those 13 Suspicious Incidents, part one and two. Yeah. You could maybe break it up into like two seasons with six episodes each. Maybe. Or just one long documentary. Yeah. That would be nice. Mini movie almost. Yeah. Yeah. Because they, I mean, they they got a, I I wrote it down somewhere here, but they got a. If you watch all the way to the end, after the credits and after the weird dubbing credits, they have uh, markings listed for like the production house, and it's called Question or something like that. And they're using the sketch drawing of Lemony Snicket from All the Wrong Questions mm. for it. So I don't know if that's just for design or aesthetic, or just there to say, hey, look, we're gonna do that too. Okay. Yeah. Also, what was Quigley in the Grim Grotto in the books? Because I don't think he was. I don't remember him being in that. I didn't. I didn't reread. I reread some of the books in preparation for this, but I didn't read Grim Grotto just because it wasn't personal a personal favorite of mine. Yeah, I I always have trouble pronouncing the name of the mushroom, the the fung the mycelium the fun- fungoid or something like that. <laughs> the medusoid mycelium. Yeah. There it is. Yeah, I can never. I I hear it and then I never say it because that's the problem with the books. You read the books, and then you always have your own pronunciation for all the words. Absolutely. And then you watch a show, and you're like, that's not how you're supposed to say it. Yep. There was a whole big argument um, about people arguing over – argument about arguing. Argument about how to pronounce Dumont from the Hotel Dumont. Okay. And people were saying it was like Deuteronomy or something. Cause people... Well, it's the, it's the same thing that happened when they released the first Harry Potter movie. Everyone's like, that's not how you say Hermione. Mm-hmm. It's not Hermione. It's something else. Okay. Hermione or whatever. Now let's move on to the uh, penultimate peril, parts one and two. And uh, my first thing is at the beginning or somewhere near the beginning. I don't remember where it happens. Well, first thing, it's not the penultimate peril. It's, it's just penultimate, penultimate peril. peril. Yes. A penultimate peril. Le penultimate peril. Okay. Uh, there's some stock footage that they use behind Lemony when he's talking about elephants. And I was just thinking, wow, I wish we had that for VBS last year. <laughs> Checks credits it, for the it, stock Yeah, it looked, it looked better too. Mm-hmm. And we got to do it again this year because this year's safari theme or something. Oh, my gosh. Unless we no. don't do it. Okay. I have full ideas for that, but that's like for a whole meeting or something. That's Fantastic. <laughs> okay. So uh, what are your thoughts on this one? I, this is my personal favorite book mm-hmm. out of the bunch. Like I said, this is the one that like everybody in school was talking about and like really hyped up and I had my trouble getting my hands on a copy for a while. I had to borrow it from somebody else. But uh yeah, I really like this one. This I don't thinking back on it, I don't know what made me gravitate towards the book. I think it's that like everyone comes back. I, yeah, I guess it's just the reunion episode, everybody making a comeback and then Everybody just getting wiped off the board. Yeah. Just one big 
Reset. In terms of what they did with the Netflix series, I liked it. I really like that was the mm-hmm. hotel in my mind. Mm-hmm. That was exactly almost exactly. The elevator scene was a little different. Yeah. In my own head, but for the most part, yeah. Cuz um didn't Netflix do a thing a couple like last year or 2 years ago where they were trying this choose your own adventure type movie? They still are. They just released uh it's uh, Black Mirror. Mm-hmm. They released a special Black Mirror episode uh, that's specifically you can choose your own adventure. Yeah. And then they released uh, Minecraft Story Mode as a movie, but it's still the whole game yeah. from season one. So you ch- hmm. make your own choices, and it's it's really interesting. It's I'm curious to see what they're going to do with it. I would had some hope that they were going to do that here, or like when he says you can go anywhere. Because like in the book, he's like, turn to this chapter and just read ahead and then come back. Yeah. And I was thinking, oh, maybe they'll do that here, but no. Mm. They kind of did a little bit, but nah. It didn't really matter anyway. No. It's all the same. I was fine with it, how they depicted it. Yeah. Uh, okay. So here uh, we get a lot in this episode. We we see more of that stuff they've been writing in about VFD backstory and history they did. And they uh, showed the night at the opera, the infamous night at the opera. Yeah, which, okay. It was a little confusing. I had to watch that little scene with the dart like five to ten times just to I had figure to, out. I had to explain to my brother that it was Kit who threw the dart and not Lemony. I thought it was Beatrice. I'm sorry. It was Beatrice who okay. threw the dart and not I like, Lemony. I, I looked at that a long time. You can't tell me but that was But he's Kit. like, going, but his hand was up, but he confessed. I'm like, yes, he confessed because it's the woman he loved, and of course he's going to be falling on a sword for her. Yeah, because I, I had... I had watched it on my. I was watching it on my phone, at like the first couple of minutes, and then I put it on my computer, uh, my old one, which has a smaller screen, mm. and then I put it on this one because it has a bigger screen, and I'm just like screenshotting and zooming and trying to look at everyone's hands. Who has a dart in their hand still? Who doesn't? Anyway, <laughs> um, it was also confusing when uh, Snicket cuts to that uh, to the where the outline of the body will be. Yeah, I was when he did that the first time. I was like, okay. Well, I don't remember this in the hotel. Yeah. So, Olaf's dad, what was he to VFD? Because before we see the end and we learn about Eshmiel, I thought, I was like, oh, he must have been like the head of VFD, but he's not. So, what was he? Was he just like the head of- the official of head of the fire department. The real fire department. Yes. Figurative fire department. No, the literal fire oh, department. Sorry. Yes. The I, VFD is the figurative. Figurative literal. Oh, I got to watch that scene again. <laughs> Okay, so, like, did he know about VFD? Do you think he knew about VFD? The... No, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, he was clearly oblivious to his son's antics. Mm-hmm. Even though they're in the same opera, he's like, my son, who I believe is out there, I love you. Stay safe. Somewhere. Okay. Do you have anything else on that? Because I didn't write much. I just basically enjoyed this episode just watching it. No, it's a great episode. Go watch it. Yeah. If, I mean, if... If you're watching the rest of the series, this is a really good one mm-hmm. out of the bunch. I'd, I'd probably really... go back and rewatch this one one day. Probably. The one thing is um, we didn't see Sir and Charles. We didn't. Hey. I thought it was in the trailer. Wasn't it like, in like a, some teaser I think trailer? The, there was a tease. I think it was the um, – There's a promotional the, the, image or something. Nah. I think it was the scene in the hot tub or the sauna. Yeah. That maybe – People saw a flash of him. Was like, <gasps> oh yeah, because the smoke cloud and all that. Yeah, but we also didn't see Jacqueline, which apparently, uh, in an interview with Joe, the person who wrote this episode with Daniel, uh, said that they had to basically kill off Jacqueline from the storyline from here on out because it would ruin the plot. It would basically create a huge plot hole because she would notice. In in the whole big trial scene, she would be the one to open her eyes and with the bottle airs and then see the, the people and then cause the whole thing to fall apart. And then the story itself would not be able to stick to the books from here. Well, they could have killed her before that. Yeah. They just – they didn't do anything about her though. They're just like – she didn't show up. Well, OK. She was one of the – more than likely, she's one of the volunteers who arrived late. Yeah. Which is very unfashionable. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. But it saved their life. True. Okay, now the end. The one big one we were all waiting for. 
so many great things in this episode. Yeah, I but they answered too many questions. To, yes, yeah, they should. I don't know. I'm not complaining. I am, but I'm not happy about it because I actually, I actually wanted to see it. But anyway, I was fine. I'm perfectly fine with having not all the answers. Yeah. To the to all the questions that they posed. That's okay. That's, I feel you like you can some... end your series and have people vaguely angry at you because they yeah. didn't get the answers they wanted. I think some it's probably some executive producer somewhere's fault. Could have been that they're like we could have been have he, some sort of ending for them. Could have been Handler really really wanted to address something after all this yeah. time people would just keep misinterpreting things and he's just like no you idiots it's this. Cuz in his interview he said he gets like hundreds of emails a month. Oh, I'm sure. from people giving him all his theories and he's like <laughs> he's like First of all, these are all the same theories he keeps setting me. Second of all, he said that there's only only two people a year actually guessed what was in the sugar bowl. Because he said he personally and then, Yeah, and then they answer what's in the sugar bowl. Yeah. Doesn't make sense. Maybe I mean, it makes cool. sense contextually. I get, I get that, and it completes that little narrative that started at the beginning of season three. Mm-hmm. But what? What was your personal opinion before you knew what was in the sugar bowl? What did you think was in there? I don't know. I always thought it was a mystery. I never knew what was in that thing. Okay. I It was just one big old question mark. And I was fine with that. I was happy with it being a nebulous nothing. Mm-hmm. For all I knew, there was nothing in it. Yeah. And it was just the idea of, that's my sugar bowl. How dare you? Yeah. I had three solid theories that I would constantly tell people, which were it was a horseradish apple. There you which go. It kind of matches up. Yeah. It was the whistle for the abominating beast, which now that we see it, it definitely does not fit in there. No. And I thought it was nothing, just empty, and it was a MacGuffin. I mean, clearly, I, mean, I don't it think is many, a MacGuffin. many other people don't know what it is or yeah. what's in it because Esme, the whole time, she's angry because it's her sugar bowl. Yeah. Not necessarily the contents of it. It's that's my sugar bowl, and I need to finish the set. Yeah. How dare you? Yeah, and she's the perfect person to carry that out because that's yeah. The kind so of thing she I don't. Made. I never got the impression that she cared for what was inside of it or anybody else for that matter. It yeah. felt more like it's just we need to get it back for the sake of getting it back. Yeah. So this episode, going back to the beginning of the episode, it opened up with we saw a child walking down the street. Oh gee, I wonder who that child could be. For, my first thought was, is that Sunny all grown up? And then she smiled, and I didn't see big teeth. Yep. <laughs> So I wrote out a whole explanation. She didn't, Sunny and this didn't really have sharp teeth either. Yeah. I'm sure they couldn't give her like plastic fangs that you get at like, an arcade. I mean, digitally edit it? I don't yeah. know. That probably would look really weird. Yeah. Well, just imagine that they're sharp. I didn't see them. I wonder if she even had all her teeth grown in. I think by the end of the series, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I wrote out a whole theory here before I even saw the end about why I thought it was Be- uh, Beatrice. And anyway. No, wait, we know that's confirmed. Yes. Okay. Um, I A lot of these notes, the things I already addressed to here at the beginning, but we saw the statue of the Abominating Beast. Uh, okay, this one. The end is only a one-part episode. Yes. Which we had heard was announced before. and I heard it was announced it was going to be longer than the normal episode. Yeah, so that that is, yeah. It was going to be about one hour and 20 to one hour 30 minutes. Sure. Because they didn't want to break the flow and then have to add another thing and it just takes you out of the story. Yeah. But then the story writers decided they wanted to cut it down. And you can tell. Yes. Because I wrote, the end felt like it looked like it was originally a two-parter. And then because there's uh, the weird view of when we see Friday first, it feels like it's green screened. I mean, I know it's green screened, but it like blatantly green screened. Yeah. Um, we, we're missing the explanation of Ishmael's clay boots. Yes. They don't explain that. Just it feels like they would have explained it. It feel it really just feels like they just completely gloss over the middle of the story. Yeah. And Ish, Ishmael's deception and what he's doing on the island. There's a lot of weird pacing on them when they like, they it, find the tree. There's a lot of stuff at the beginning, there's a lot of stuff at the end and just it doesn't have enough time for the stuff in the middle. Yeah, they just crammed it. Cuz yeah. the hardest thing for me was the weird pacing of when they find the treehouse thing. Yep. It's just like, oh, we found it. We found it. Oh, no. Ishmael's yeah. evil or something. Speaking of Ishmael, he was... No, call me Ish. Yeah, sorry. Why won't anybody call me Ish? <laughs> Speaking of Ish, 
Uh, so he was apparently the principal of Prufac Prep, which was not in the books. No, either. I was really surprised by that. They set that up in the previous episode, mm-hmm. and that was like a throwaway line to me. I was like, okay, well, neat. And I was actually, I was actually really happy with that yeah. change. I was like, oh my gosh, that's incredible! It makes a lot of sense. Sure, yeah, it it does. And that's like because we also find out he's the founder of VFD. Yeah, apparently. So that makes sense that, that Proof Prep was like a school for VFD. It just kind of calls people. into question his age. Yeah. Because if he supposedly started VFD with the Baudelaire's parents when they were kids, how old is he now? How old were they when they died? It just feels like he would be a lot older. It's the same mm-hmm. thing with Up, mm-hmm. you know, the, the hero that uh, Carl – idolizes at the beginning of the movie. He's really young and the, the guy's like already middle-aged or seniors. Yeah. And then they both meet up and they're both old men. It's like, that doesn't match up. Yeah. Don't don't ruin the movie. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So that that, that that was interesting to, to finally see that backstory there of who's the founder and all that. Um, which to me, I guess I don't understand why he didn't want to help them as much. Unless he kind of turned on his own organization. I mean, in a, in his own way, he kind of did help. He, he, they try to justify his actions. He's like, you know, it's like being a parent is difficult and you try to do the best for your kids and, you know, you, you want them to take the best path. But in the end, you know, you're going to make mistakes and you don't know – you don't have all the answers. Yeah. So I could see where they were going with it. But again, they just if they had more time, it probably would have been smoother. Yeah. So uh, I know we've beaten the subject down on the Sugar Bowl, but uh, I wrote down exactly what they said. So it says, um, Klaus says, what's in the Sugar Bowl? And then uh, Kit says, sugar from a botanical hybrid VFD developed to defend us against the mycelium. Medusoid mycelium. Yeah, uh, horseradish cures cures you. The hybrid immunizes you. So there we go. I don't. I mean, was it really that big of a threat that they had to? They kind of built it up as more of a threat, but eh, yeah, it's hard to see that. Me. Yeah. Okay. We're going going back to Grim Grotto. Mm-hmm. Was it? I can't remember if Gregor and Whistle was actually trying to weaponize it or colonize the mycelium to spread it. No, it was it was someone else who was there, I think. No, 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 it was Gregor. He was doing it. Fernald was the one saying, no, mm. don't do it. Okay. I'm sure if I'm wrong, I'm going to get a bunch of angry emails and something else. All three. <laughs> okay. Um, so after Kit washes up and she has the baby and Count Olaf dies. So Kit's washing up makes more sense in this because the last time we see her, she's on the Queequeg. Yeah. So... That explains why she washed up on a pile of books. Mm-hmm. It's from the library of the Queequeg. Her in the book didn't make any sense to me. Yeah. I And that's not how I imagined the raft to look in my mind. No. Well, sort of. I kind of imagined it to have a bit of height to it. I didn't imagine it to be so cube, cuboid and yeah. just so big. But I did imagine it to be kind of like that. I just imagined how you would like build a Lego boat with like – one long flat piece and then a bunch of bricks creating a wall around a center. I suppose. So anyway, she washes up. She has Beatrice. She dies. Count Olaf dies. She, she dies after having a poignant scene with Olaf. Yes. Which, which is... I think they played more comedically in this, especially okay. the last line he said to the Baudelaire's. Mm. I don't it, know. It, I don't know. It, it felt, felt weird. It did. I thought in the books it was much more subdued and much more – romantic almost Mm -hmm. because it's instead of I always saw you know Olaf is like the sneering sinister man and then when he finally meets up with Kit they has this tender moment and we see what he was before the schism really took place yeah so it it just I don't think it reflected or translated as well as it could have into the series Mm -hmm. yeah Uh, I think it was still a nice moment but could have been nicer yeah so we would tell the writers. I will. Uh, okay. So they uh, – do you think they dragged their dead bodies all the way back to the treehouse and buried them there? 
because they put the little headstone things in the ground. Yeah, but the headstones could be symbolic. My... Then their bodies would have gotten washed out into the tide, and then that would be weird. I suspect they probably just dragged their bodies up a little ways and yeah. buried them where the tide couldn't get it. But Oh, well, that's besides I, the point. In the book, again, going back to the book, I always saw them. They just buried them where they were. Yeah. And there was no problem. Crabs. Whatever. <laughs> so at this point, um, they have Beatrice, and they have to start basically raising her for a year until they can leave the island. Yep. Which we find out is eye-shaped. Yes, they what, showed that off very early when we first arrived. What was the point of that? They had, there was no reason to do that. I guess it was just to show that it was still connected to VFD because it mm-hmm. was. It was yeah. It was where they set up the horseradish factory mm-hmm. to create the Im- immunization or the cure. It's not It's not an Im- immunization because whenever. So in the books, we, we're not told what actually happens with the quagmires, right? They nope. just leave it. But in the movie, now we know, the movies, the TV show, series – we see that the Quagmires survived. We also see that the Wittishan family found their stepfather. Yeah, and this is going back to just leave the vague. Leave it vague and leave it nice and yeah. mysterious. Draw your own conclusions whether or not they survive or they die. Well, the troop gets to create their own successful program and theater show. Yeah. The snake swims after the Ishmael and his colony yeah. with an apple. Which... But it doesn't, it doesn't. again, it doesn't say... They ate the apple. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ishmael could easily have just said, a snake, kill it. I won't force you to, but kill it. That's what I would do. Mm -hmm. So uh, after all this stuff, we wrap up some of the loose ends that some people wanted, uh, some people didn't want. And uh, we get to Lemony saying, sometimes stories go on even after the storyteller stopped telling them. And then we um, see what happens in the cafe. Yes. Beatrice Baudelaire. She got their last name, right? Yeah. Beatrice Baudelaire. Wasn't it supposed to be Beatrice Stickett in the books? No. Because that's what I remember. Because I went on the on the Wikia thing and I Googled search for Beatrice Stickett and that's what showed up. No, I don't think so. I think it was hmm. always Beatrice Baudelaire. Huh. Interesting. So what did you think of the cafe scene? <laughs> I thought it was fine. It didn't... I I could have done without it, but for what we just saw, it's fine because yeah. it didn't answer any other questions. It just said Beatrice Baudelaire survives. Yeah. And she grew she's grown up to this point, which means that the Baudelaire's other Baudelaire survived. Does it? We don't know that. It's, I mean, it's not like she's a baby as far as them off. As far as we know, they only got as far as the mainland and then they died. And mm-hmm. she's been hoofing it on her own ever since. I guess I mean she could do it. I don't doubt her capabilities. You have to and, read into the vagueness. Yes. I'm sure there's a whole Tumblr post that's like 70 scrolls long with theories on this. So we see that. We see Lemony meets Beatrice Baudelaire. We, they, they talk. They have root beer floats or something. And they, they go scrapbooking <laughs> or whatever. Sure. And that's the end of the, the season or in the series. In the series, as a whole. So, over the entire season. Oh, by the way, the city was also an eye as well. VFD is everywhere. Yeah. Oh, whoa. I wonder if anyone in Google Earth looks at that. <laughs> because apparently there's Uber here. And Sonny's like, get an Uber back in season one. Oh, yeah. It's, wow. That was a long time ago. Well, they they were trying to keep it the setting to be kind of this quasi-50s, 60s, 70s era. Yet he bought stuff on the internet. It's it's all a mix. You never know what time it is. Yeah. You don't know where it is. Nope. It's got to be on the coast somewhere because there's water, but other than that. So, over this entire season, season three, what are your thoughts? Do you think they did a good job? Could I think they better? did a fine job adapting it and translating it to the screen. For the most part, it looked exactly how I have always imagined it. Mm-hmm. It uh, covered all it needed cover and then some and, you know, to each their own. It was good. It was fine. I lo- and plus, it's enjoyable. The All the actors I thought were particularly well, mm-hmm. were particularly good. 
Neil Patrick Harris's Olaf wasn't nearly as funny as he has been in the previous two seasons. But that's just because we're getting more to the dramatic end. Yeah. And, you know, things are getting ramping up and getting more crazy. They didn't so. give him a musical number this season. They did didn't. They? I was surprised by that. They started to yeah. in Penultimate Peril. And I, I think that was kind of the joke is that he was about to do a song and they squashed it. Yeah, because they heard what people said about season two and they're like – Keep chasing your schemes just went on too long. Yeah, it did. It's like keep doing it, keep doing it. Keep, what is this a Hill song song or something? Let's keep going on. This is, you know, why they did it? Because hmm. Neil Patrick Harris can sing. Sure. Sure, he can. <laughs> I mean, he can't, but anyway. Okay, so over the entire series, all the adaptations, what do you think? Good. Certainly better than the movie. Uh, yep. How far did the movie get? Book How three. many books? Book three. Okay. And they wanted to do a whole big... They wanted to keep going. They yeah. wanted to make sequel after sequel and cover like three each book, each yeah. Uh, movie. Yeah. They, to be honest, I haven't seen the movie because... I haven't either. I've yeah. seen clips of it, but it's not enjoyable. Okay. Because I my cousin had it. And it's very it's very much like uh, Tim Burton. I, got, I always got like the impression James and the Giant Peach for some reason. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. It's the color scheme. I suppose... Especially uh, when they get into the third book, the Lake Lacrimos and the visual look, the visual style that they went with was interesting. Okay. I'm putting it on my watch list to watch it one day. If I can find a copy somewhere, probably at the library. So my personal thoughts on the entire season or series is that it it's perfect representation of the book series it, in my mind, what I saw. And it filled in some of the holes that... I believe should have been filled in in the book and then some other holes that weren't holes and they just piled on information that we didn't want to know. But I kind of wish there were more ciphers or more codes codes, yeah. and just clues hidden out throughout the series. And I'm sure there probably are. There are yeah. people who are like looking through – combing through – each episode and saying like, oh, look, and you see, you can see in the background this mm-hmm. visual clue here. But I mean like they didn't do that uh, thing that they do in the books where at the end of each book the illustration would always have some cl- visual clue as to what the next book would be. Mm-hmm. I, they should have done that. Ah, oh, man. Why didn't they do that? That would have been neat, adapting that somehow. Now, they did put a bunch of um, clues and stuff codes into the incomplete history of secret organization. I saw that and apparently uh, they they t- said not to solve it until after you've watched season yeah, 3. Yeah, because the season 3 was supposed to come out earlier and then it got pushed back and the book still came out. Yeah. And so they're like, don't don't read it. Don't read it. Don't buy it. Just leave it alone. Yeah. Don't go there. Sending out PAs across the nation, all the Barnes and Nobles. Just don't buy the book. Don't. Just kind of put it in the back and uh, just Ignore it. I'll drop it off when season three comes out. Have you read that yet? I read the preview that's online. Okay. It yeah, looks interesting. It. Yeah. I wonder if the library has it. I'll have to look. If not, got to find I, the I'd get it. I'd number. get it more for the visual look. It'd be on the shelf. Yeah. Because I like having books like that stand out like that. It'd be a nice like coffee table book or whatever. Sure. Okay, so those are all my notes on this entire season and series as a whole. And uh, I've got to be running sound in like 20 minutes. So I'm going to run to this ending here. So recommendations of the week. Do you have anything you want to recommend? I've been re-watching The West Wing. Okay. Even, I mean, even though I've seen it like four times now, the whole series. <laughs> Do you know what The West Wing is? Yeah. Yeah, I would recommend it. Have you even- ever heard the West Wing Weekly podcast? I've heard of it, but I haven't actually listened to it. Apparently, a lot of the actors and writers and people are on that, and it's hosted like by one of the writers or something. Okay, cool. They go episode by episode and then interview people about I it. I mean, I should probably go listen to it actually. Okay, but I mean, even though it's the show is like really left leaning, and there's somebody online, a reviewer who said, you know, who are these dewdrop, perfect, idealistic people with shining faces? Who are these people that just show up on, in Washington and, of course, have the perfect moral stance on mm-hmm. everything? So, yeah, I mean, if you can get past that and the whole left-leaning agenda, it's it's actually a pretty good series. Okay. My recommendation of the week, like I said earlier, is the Unfortunate Associates podcast, since we're on the subject of it. Um, each week, they go on the show 
or not each week. It's, lately, it's been like once a month because they're really trying to stretch it out now that they're running out of stuff to talk about. Oh, it used to be each week, and now it's like once a month. You get it a week early if you're a Patreon subscriber. Oh, great! But uh, it's still good. It's they they go they went epis they went book by book through the book series. Talked about each book. Then they went episode by episode through the seasons. Okay. Right now, they just finished up season two, and they're going to start season three. Uh, and they have a bunch of interviews with the writers, with Lemony Snicket himself, with actors, all sorts of things. And they're trying to get a bunch of um, people who worked on the show to come out and talk about it. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's pretty interesting. There's a lot of different discussions. So that's that. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. Thank you, James, for being on the show. Sure thing. So if this was your first time listening, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else podcasts are available. If you want to link if you're, what I said, your thing isn't there, Just uh, links for all of our locations are available at rta.space slash listen. If you have any suggestions, you want to comment, you want to send me an angry email about something, you want to send us jokes because I'm running out of jokes, you can email me. Please, please yes. send him jokes. They need to get better. Or you're going to get more dad jokes is what you get. You can email me, rocket to anywhere show at gmail.com, or you can tweet at me at RTA show on Twitter. We also have Instagram if you want to DM us there at rocket to anywhere. We're not the band. Speaking of which, there's a band also named Rocket to Anywhere, and they just released their new album. And so. Are they any good? Yeah. Eh, if you like California surfer pop eh. rock ish, it's okay. Anyway, we're always fighting, and so we'll get like these. um messages people tag us and like we loved going to your concert last night and they because we have the better username <laughs> so because we were around before them so anyway we're getting all these people and then like sometimes they just repost like thanks for coming out to our live recording sure <laughs> okay hey you're welcome you can come to our concerts anytime i always thought that if we ever did a live show we would have them come out and perform our intro song for us rocket to anywhere with rocket to anywhere Okay, show notes for this week's episode are available at rta.space slash 59. You can follow me on Twitter at Corbron Garcia. And James, is there anywhere people can follow you? Not really. I have a Facebook, but I barely frequent it. Okay. I don't have Twitter. I don't do Instagram. I have a YouTube channel, but it's more for uploading just personal school projects or something like that. Okay. Well, we'll be back soon. Now that we've left our every other week schedule, because now we're putting more effort into these things, um, I think our next episode will be about the last episode of Odd Squad, which has been announced to be next week on Monday, as of this recording, which is sad. They're wrapping up after like 10 seasons. Oh no. It's ending. All because they incorrectly described a trapezoid as a sign with one set of straight sides. What a bunch of idiots. Yeah, anyway. We'll be probably having a special guest on that one. And then the week after that, we'll be covering the release of Season 2B, as Amazon calls it. They don't call it Season 3. They call it Season 2B. That's dumb. Of uh, Just Add Magic, which is the final one, hopefully. So we'll have the scoop on that one, as they say. Well, until then, thank you for being on the show again. Yeah, I guess uh, that this rocket has landed. We'll have to come up with something better sometime. There you go. And we'll layer that in post. There you go. It'll hopefully sound right. I don't think it will. <laughs> don't 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 work too hard on that one. I can fix something. I I'd... can fix it. I can fix it. That's what I say. Sitting at my desk waiting for Final Cut to render. I can fix it. Just just Okay. I just need more time.